in the next 45 minutes or so, you're going to hear me talk. And we're all very similar people. We can only concentrate for more than Mm, we can't concentrate for more than a few minutes at any time. So whilst I'm talking and giving it all of this, you'll be thinking about lunch or what you've got to do when you finish. Then you'll come back in again, just like your learners. Uh, mais je dois dire que quand je parle, uh, quand j'enseigne je, en français, à mon avis, j'enseigne mieux qu'en anglais. Parce que là, je suis consciente de la langue, j'ai les choix même. Tandis que quand je parle anglais... Pff, OK, donc vous avez vraiment, si vous n'êtes anglo, euh, si anglais ou anglophone, vous avez vraiment un avantage quand vous, quand vous enseignez dans vos classes. OK. So, um, what I'd like you to do during the session is to not make notes. Anybody who wants the PowerPoint can have it. But to write a memo to self. A memo to self, to me, is when you write down two, three, four points, words even, okay? Is it clicking? Is it my jacket? It's this one. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. Okay, good, 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 good. I've got to be still, and I'm not very good at being still. Um, so, the issue that I've got is that it doesn't matter how many policies we have, the only thing to me that matters it, is what goes on in our classrooms. And no policies can tell us what goes on in our classrooms. We have to have those pedagogic principles. And, you know, the primary school teachers, that's a given. You deal with pedagogy all the time, you're making the curriculum accessible. What happens as we get higher and higher and higher, assumptions are made. And assumptions are made about the language and about the pedagogy. And unless we really look at how we design our classrooms, how we design our lessons, don't even get me started about lesson planning. How can you possibly plan a lesson of 40 minutes? We don't learn in that way, but anyway, that's for another time. Um, but we need to have really clear principles for how we operate in our classroom. And if you are working in a bilingual setting, these are not what come naturally to us. Okay, so you might think that some of the stuff I'm doing is completely irrelevant, but let's, let's go. So, three key points. It's complex. It's really, really complex. Bilingual education is complex. If it were easy, everybody would do it, and we'd have quadrilingual young people. We don't. The key thing for me is around subject literacies. Now, as soon as I say the word literacies, people think it's learning to read and write. And by the time my 17-year-olds come to me, they can read and write. I'm not talking about literacy in the sense of learning to read and write. I'm talking about subjects. And the more subject-oriented we, we, we become, there's a book, uh, there's a, a concept of academic tribes and their territories, okay? So we've got to be really clear about what our subject literacies are in our own subject areas. And then it's all about learning design. So I want us to start with there's something horribly wrong here, and I don't know what it is. It's not the PowerPoint that I thought it was going to be. Not sure what's happened. Ah, I do know what's happened. Sorry. Talk amongst yourselves. Well, it's it's not that, that that's not the right one on there. So I don't know what's happened in the technology, you know. So that's. 
No, 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 no. No, it's something's happened. <laughs> I need to go back to this. No, 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 no. And can you go back to? Do you want me to do it? No, 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 no. No. I don't know what's. I don't have no idea what's happened. This is good. You can. I should be now giving you anecdotes, but see the, the, none of the. If you go on there, if you just click the, the latest one, that should come up, and that's the one. That's the one. No idea what's happened. Uh, it, it's, it's the merging of the PowerPoint, I think, that's happened. So, um, while this is getting sorted out, <laughs> this is it. This is correct. So, can you click on? Yeah. Yeah. Problem solved. The golden rule is never, ever, ever rely on technology. And I was just about to launch force because I don't really need anything visual. But anyway, so to get us started very quickly, I want to just, um, yeah, I just want you to reflect. Where's my mouse? Okay, let's go. <laughs> Okay, you might think, well, what's all that about? Well, it's about what's happening. And if we don't have real world in our classrooms, how can we possibly be preparing 
our young people for that working world. And it's affecting who our students are. And I feel that we're ignoring it at our peril. And whatever kind of institution you work in, that's changing, and it will change quite rapidly. And the world around us is also changing, and I think that has to be part of our pedagogy. We, can't, we really can't ignore it. So if I'm walking down the street, the main street in Edinburgh, I will hear more Polish being spoken than I will Scots. Okay. So these shifts in landscape impact on what we do in the classroom, or they should. And when we close that door, and it's us and our students, then actually it's who we are and what we do that really matters. So how can we best serve our students? Because you know, there's a lot of research, and research, we know a lot about language now. And we know a lot about learning, and we know a lot about language learning. But how do we bring them all together? And we already live in this plurilingual world, and in a place, in a country like Switzerland, you already have this notion of bilingualism. So what does that actually mean? And if we're looking at philosophies, and I really think that these are so important that we should talk about them. You know, what is driving our bus? What makes me tick in my classroom? And if you take the UNESCO Four Pillars, about learning to know, to do, to live together, and to be, then I would say that pedagogy is who we are and not what necessarily what we do. And so I think we need to look at the role of language in learning. And for those of you who might identify as being language teachers, first and foremost, and those of you that might identify as being subject specialists, we've got to bring those worlds together because we have very different mindsets and skills. There may, for, fortunately, there may be some people in here, I envy them, that might be both, uh, they might have both come through a dual route of being uh, a, a, a subject expert and a, lag, a language expert. But we have to acknowledge some of the core principles. And the main, the main theme of this is, if we are engaging in bilingual education, we have to know what our principles are. Otherwise, it's translation, and translation is hopeless. It doesn't work. It can't work. Because we're only translating language. And remember, words are meaningless. They're just codes. So translation doesn't work. And it's, to me, it's about literacies. And we hear a lot about approaches. We hear task-based. We hear phenomenon-based. That's from Finland. Why is that so important? Because Finland always do well on the PISA results. Huh? But Finland is not Switzerland. It's not Scotland. The concept, the country, the cultures are different. We can't compare. It's like comparing the apples and the oranges. They're different. And one important um, approach, I think, is to look at the learning classroom as an ecology, because it's what goes on inside individual classrooms, those human relationships, those principles that are put into practice that really matter. So um, I'm going to move straight on to something that's very important. Um, in the European Commission, a while ago now, there was the notion that we bring together all language as a concept. Because it says this, and I'm going to read, language teaching can no longer be seen as something done in a classroom separate from other subjects. So those of you that are about to be involved or are involved in Billy projects already know that it's not about that separation. For equity, and I hold that so strong, if you think about some of those images, then equity is crucial. And quality in education for all, we have to get the uh, attention to language and the way we are using it. That is not the same as what you do when you learn a language and you have to look at grammar. I'll say that again. It is not the same. It's different. So, that's around 
um, the way that we're bringing these literacy practices together. So what I'm talking about when I'm talking about language, I'm not talking about the grammar system, I am talking about the literacy, and more to the point, I'm talking about the literacy that is connected to every single one of your subjects. Okay, by subjects, I don't mean your pupils, I mean your, um, your disciplines. Okay. Oh, and by the way, in Scotland, you're allowed to say pupil. Um, it's banned in England, you can't say pupil, everybody's a student, but in Scotland you can say pupils. So, what do you see? You know, it's about the growth mindset, and Carol Dweck's work has had quite an impact. We've got to get this opening of the minds, okay? And so we're normalising integrated learning. Pedagogic approach approaches are about this mindset. So, the little stars mean that these are good slides. So number one, uh, language is our greatest learning tool. I'll say that again, language is our greatest learning tool. An integrated approach by, uh, to language is for all learners. It's not just for those who can already speak a language. There is an assumption that the higher you go in your language, the less you need to take attention of it. No. I would argue that a CLIL approach or a bilingual approach to education is informing first language education as well because it brings together all those elements. Um, it's not monolingual. Just think this morning, we've been switching languages. It's not a monolingual process. We need to use the, all the language resources that we have. So if you are doing Billy in English, you may well have lots of languages being spoken, whilst the main one, obviously, the work, the key work will be done in English, but, and it's not, certainly not the same as TESOL and so on. So we have to use it, translanguaging. Can I just say one thing? Grammatical chronology, as the only determinant of language use, is not appropriate. I want to use some complicated tense, I need it. I want it now. Okay? It's a concept. I want, that, I want that tense now. It doesn't mean I want the whole paradigm. It means I want to be able to express myself appropriately, and when I analyse afterwards, I can easily get the, or more easily get the rules out. So, grammatical chronology does not work in a bilingual setting. Even with beginners, you know, if you only, if you say, you can't do that, we haven't done the past tense yet. I mean, the kind of language you're doing then is me, Tars, and you, Jane. Um, so, the growth principles then. Right, language has got to be visible, and it's complicated. And it's a leveller. You know, I think bilingual education is a leveller. It gives that opportunity for all learners to start to engage. So, earlier on, the, uh, it was introduced about the, the four C's. The four C's came about when I was working with some Spanish teachers a long time ago now. We were, had a huge piece of paper on the floor and we were on our hands and knees scribbling. We had no idea it would go viral at that time. And the reason why I think it went viral is that it's just common sense. So that if we are planning and designing our bilingual work, we have to think about those elements. So, there it is, it's on your handout, but those are the four issues. Let's have a look at them very quickly. The first one is content, and the C for content, well, everybody knows what their content is. However, you know, knowledge, which is part of our content, isn't just facts. So we've got different kinds of knowledge. Different kinds of knowledge require different kinds of language, okay? So we have factual, conceptual, procedural, metacognitive, all of those are your content. So the first thing you have to do when you're looking at your content is not to think, right, okay, I've got to do this, this period in history, or I've got to do uh, hygiene because we're working with uh, chefs. Mm -mm. It's around taking the concepts that underlie it. Cognition. 
All right, getting the thinking going. We often, uh, often Bloom's taxonomy, we talk about higher order thinking and higher order skills, but they also require the kinds of tasks and activities to be progressed. The design of those tax and tasks and, and activities are crucial, okay? And it's about creativity with language. Now, to language is a verb. It is. Okay, so we can talk about languaging. Languaging is brilliant. What is it? It's when you ask your learners to put into their own words, not your words, not the words of the textbook or the sheet, into their own words what they think they've learned. It's not really done very much. Question and answer sequencing doesn't get at languaging. It gets at this, you know, I always do use this example with the principle of Archimedes, right? Remember the principle of Archimedes? Yeah? The principle of Archimedes? Yeah? If a body is wholly or partly immersed in a fluid, it appears to lose weight, and the apparent loss in weight is equal to the volume of the liquid displaced. Done. Did I understand that when I was learning it? No. And then we had one teacher who said, go home, Homework tonight is to have a bath. Those were the days when you had a bath, you know, you didn't have showers. Have a bath, sit in the bath, lift your right leg out of the bath, and something will happen. And sure enough, the bath water goes down and your leg feels very heavy. Ah, I get it, I understand it. And that is the difference. So then I could actually put into my own words what the principle of Archimedes actually is. So, language is a verb. And then we come across this big discussion. Do we focus on language? Do we focus on uh, content? It's both. You can't have either or. And far too much time has been put into this. Is it, is it this or is it the other? And I'll explain more about it in a moment. The other thing is correction. What do we do about correction? Read this from Mohan. Is a, a Canadian. We are not aware of any evidence or explicit and detailed claims that the correction of errors of grammatical form is a sufficient condition for the development of oral and written language as a medium of learning. Okay? Then we come to the C for communication, which is language. It had to be communication because it's the C, okay? Um, so we've talked about languaging, and then we have the triptych. And again, this is a really, really good little tool because what it says is, in your classroom, you will be needing different sorts of language. Language of learning is all the learning, that, the, all the language that you need with your particular topic. Easy, that's done brilliantly. Well, there's a lot of bilingual lists, and, you know, bilingual lists, okay, but... Then there's language for learning, which is all the language that you need to operate. So, when you're dealing with 16, 17, 18-year-olds, if they're going to have a discussion, it needs to be a discussion that is expected of a 16-year-old, and not, I like it because I like it. In other words, a limited language should not and cannot limit the cognitive level at which we are operating. Right? It just can't. That's not education. So we have to constantly be thinking, if I want my learners to discuss appropriately, as a 16, a 17-year-old would want to, about real-world issues, I've got to put that in. I've got to teach it. Okay? And language through learning is the, lang is the language that you get. The more that you... Uh, the more that you learn, the, the deeper that your concepts are, the more language you will produce. You can't plan for this, but you've got to be ready for it. And culture is really what the visual display was all about earlier on, the culture of the context in which we're working, but it's also the culture of the subject you are working in. Okay? It's never neutral. Never. So, the challenge is this. How do we focus on language in our subject areas? 
when the OECD 2016 report is saying that all of our young people need literacy, numeracy, and problem solving in technology rich environments. Okay. Can we sort this one out? <laughs> Nobody is born speaking academic. And academic is a problem word because the very word academic immediately, well, certainly in a, uh, an Anglophone context, you think about bright, intelligent people who are older, going to university perhaps. Mm -mm. Academic language starts the moment that a child steps into school and in some families before that. And it needs to be taught, it needs to be acquired, and that is our job. So what does all this mean for classroom design? Thinking and knowledge construction require different kinds of language which do not automatically depend on grammatical knowledge and understanding. So that means we have to do our planning not according to grammar, but according to the concepts that we are teaching our young people and the activities that we are wanting them to do. Okay? So, don't forget languaging. Where are they going to have that opportunity to articulate in their own words what they've learnt? So, the four C's were then were about meaning making. And remember, knowledge isn't transferable in that way. We all make meaning. And at the end of this session, if there are 120 people in this room, there'll be 120 versions of what I've just said. Okay, that's fine. The more the better. So, meaning making involves knowing, that's our content, thinking, our cognition, articulated, our communication, in ways which demonstrate cultural awareness for this world that we're inhabiting. So, depending on what you're doing, I don't know what your different courses are, um, this is more related to perhaps, um, I don't know, more um, typical subject areas, but scientists, historians and geographers, they think differently. We do similar sorts of things, but in a different way. So you might say, well, describing and classifying, but the way you would do that if you were a mathematician would be different from the way you would do it if you were a geographer. There was a, an experiment done where one text was given to an expert mathematician, chemist, and a historian. And they read that text in a different way. So for the mathematician, even the word the was crucial. For the expert chemist, he was just desperate to visualize and put it into graph format, right? to make a graph, visualizations, formulas. And the historian was just interested in the uh, sources. Okay? Now, we have to enable our young people to develop that sense of being an expert. So, if it's an expert chef, if it's an expert historian, how do these people think? And it's our duty to make sure that they are inculcated into, it's a nice word, isn't it, inculcate? Inculcated into that way of thinking. And let's not forget real world learning. Um, so, what do we mean by making learning vis vi uh, visible? It's languaging. So, you know, one of my questions to you would be, when do you get your students to language? When do they do it? It's great for assessment because you can tell immediately whether or not they have really understood. Okay, so it's a quick assessment. And then we've got all this discourse that should be flying around our classrooms. You know, what does that mean? What are our students doing? Well, you know, if I'm dealing with a 17-year-old, I would expect that 17-year-old to be able to do a lot of things, and I'm going to come on to that in a moment. So, Schrodinger's cat. You know about Schrodinger's cat? Yeah? I'm going to just... Um, time's limited, so I'll just go on to one. No, I'll go on to the first one. Da, 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 da. Ah. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay, I think I've managed. Thank you. So, this lasts one minute. 
I want you to note at which point you... in thought. Number six, when do you stop cat. understanding? Erwin Schrödinger was a physicist, a theoretical biologist, and probably more of a dog person. In the 1920s, scientists discovered quantum mechanics, which said that some particles are so tiny, you can't even measure them without changing them. But the theory only worked if, before you measure them, the particle is in a superposition of every possible state all at the same time. To tackle that, Schrödinger imagined a cat in a box, with a radioactive particle and a Geiger counter attached to a vial of poison. If the particle decays, it triggers the Geiger counter, releases the poison, and bye-bye tittles. But if the particle is in two states, both decayed and not decayed, the cat is also in two states, both dead and not dead, until someone looks in the box. In practice, it's impossible to put a cat into a superposition. You'd have the animal rights lobby up in arms. But you can isolate atoms, and they do seem to be in two states at once. Quantum mechanics challenges our whole perception of reality, so maybe it's understandable that Schrödinger himself decided he didn't like it, and was sorry he ever started on about cats. OK. How do I get back to the other one? What do I click? No, I don't want to go for philosophy. Will that be OK if I do that? Good. Right. The problem is there is that there's a problem with language because quantum physics, well, this particular element of quantum physics, is saying that at any one time, a cat, for example, could be dead or alive. Um, it's also saying that this table is not solid. Now, we don't have... Well, there's, a, there's a problem here in conceptualization, right? OK, because I don't understand that this table is not solid. I don't, that doesn't... And to me, your cat can only either be dead or alive. You can't be both. But there's a problem with language, because we don't have the language in our... We don't have the language to link to those concepts. So this is a perfect way of trying to just get the message across that unless we make the unless the concepts are related to the language and the language is accessible, we will not understand. This is from uh, Alice in Wonderland. If I had a world of my own, everything would be nonsense. Nothing would be what it is because everything would be what it isn't. And contrarywise, what is, it wouldn't be. And what it wouldn't be, it would. You see? So, really, it's all about connecting the concepts and the language. And the key thing there, uh, what I call, or what is called, lang uh, language functions, and they're called cognitive discourse functions. What I don't understand is, as soon as I talk about cognitive discourse functions, people glaze over. Um, you know, cognitive, we, we know that's to do with the brain and making us think, making us understand. Function is the use, and discourse is the language, and that is the glue, you know? So the language demanded by the context has to deepen. And the, the, when we're dealing with children the age, sorry, not children, young people, your, the ages that you're dealing with, then it's crucial that those concepts are deeper, become deeper and deeper. And with it is a sophistication of language that needs to be taught, okay? And, you know, you see them and it's kind of simulating, modeling, describing, defining. And you might say, well, yes, I do that. But it's got to be linked to the concepts. So, uh, you know all of these. OK. Um, so, about 70 years ago, there was a report that talked about language across the curriculum. And it said, all teachers are language teachers. I've actually written that and said, all teachers are language teachers. I've stopped saying that now, because as soon as you say language teacher, people think it's about a grammatical, traditional-based way of working. So I don't say that anymore. What I do say is that all teachers need to be language aware. We've got to, we've got to know how it, how it links to the concepts. So this is the important bit. A lot of work has been done in Australia and New Zealand about the way that we learn. Okay? And doing, organizing, explaining, and arguing. So it's nice and easy. So doing is what everybody's good at. Teachers are really good at doing. And that's the procedural stuff that you do in your classrooms. Getting the students to organize their thinking is also pretty good. So that's your 
taxonom uh, taxonomies, your graphs, your designs. However, explaining and arguing is much less well done. How do we get our students to explain? Where is that explanation? And then, crucially, how do we get them to argue? Because you've got to be able to argue. For goodness sake, you've got to be able to argue in this world. OK? So they need the language of arguing, but they need it at a sophisticated level that they would where they're arguing in their own language. And some of you might say, well, they couldn't do that. Hey, that's where this approach is also good for that. So the way I do it is this. You have Duplo, you have um, Lego, and you have Technic. If I've only got, if I'm building my Duplo car, I need four wheels. But if I've only got two wheels, and then I go on to my Lego, the Lego wheels won't fit on my Duplo, and so on. So in other words, if we don't do the explaining and the arguing, our little, our little cars don't go. So this is, and again, you've got this in your, uh, in your handouts, this is the little design that might help you um, move on from the four Cs. So you've got the four Cs in your planning, but then you're thinking, how do I do, develop my tasks? And there's, there's a, a construct one, down one side, uh, sorry, an axis down one side, which is about your knowledge. So what are the concepts? Take your concepts and think, right, OK, what is this concept? And what language do I need to express it? Which goes along the bottom. Then you've got your bubbles. Those are your little cars. But obviously, learning isn't so discreet. It, all mer it tends to merge. But look what links them, the cognitive discourse functions. OK? So these, and I'll move on fairly quickly, because I'm going to draw to a close. Um, I've already talked about the different kinds of knowledges. Look what goes along the bottom. Style, genre, mode. That's really important. So if you're to do with physics, and I say to you, well, what genres are you using? You might think that's most bizarre. Actually, it's most critical. It really is critical that we look at those literacies. And this is where the triptych comes in, because it leads towards pluriliteracies, which is where I think we need to go for our young people to be pluriliterate citizens in the future. So I'm going to move on there. And I'm going to say that not for now, but there are some excellent examples. If you go to the, uh, the site here, there are uh, materials have been made using these principles. And they're downloadable, um, and they're, um, they're, they're nice. OK, they're good. And some bits you'll be really familiar with, others not. All you have to do is to put your own content in there. OK, so they're really good example, example, exemplars. Yeah, that'll do. So five things to finish with, five key messages. Number one, as teachers, we have to analyze the what and the how. Okay, and we have to make it not only clear to ourselves, but to our learners. So what are our principles? And, you know, don't say, oh, that's just theory. It's not. How can we have a pedagogic approach if we don't agree on what our principles are? Okay. All teachers should be language aware, different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of language, regardless of the language medium. Message three. Pluriliteracies are crucial for all stages, ages, and languages. So we've got to make things visible. Okay? That means we've got to become much better at designing our tasks and sequencing them. Language-rich classrooms, they're not monolingual. We're not monolingual. You, know, you switch, you move, you use your other languages. And it's our responsibility to make those links. If there's one message you take, it's about analyzing your program, your curriculum, what you have to teach. It's taking the concepts. It's analyzing those concepts, which we don't do. And then it's thinking, if these are the concepts, what, as a physicist, as a chef, as a business-oriented person, 
what kind of language is the most appropriate for the world of work and for the future. Okay, and it's about this real world that I talked that I, I reflected on right at the very beginning. But the good news is that you know babies and bathwaters. I don't know whether you know that phrase. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's an awful lot of work that is going on, and I'm sure if I visited some of your classrooms, I, I, it would be fabulous. But I just think we need a reminder because this is not in our normal repertoire of skills. All right. Remember, nobody was born speaking academic, and very few teachers were born being bilingual teachers. There's a whole pedagogy around it, okay? And we have to link. We've got to talk with people in our institutions. We've got to talk about the, we've got to talk about the literacies. We've got to talk about, you know, and digital literacies, emotional literacies. They're all there. So, this is impossible, Alice said. Only if you believe it is, said the Mad Hatter. So let's slow down. That is on the road to the Isles in, the, in Scotland, where I live half the year, on an island, the Isle of, of Egg, near Skye. And it's become so famous because of Harry Potter's uh, uh, viaduct. But I think we need to slow down a bit as well. And finally, remember that it's the shift from not the bain linguistique, but for me, it's the bain d'apprentissage. Merci beaucoup. Sorry? At eight minutes? Yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you ask them or I yeah. can? Uh -huh. okay. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, Do Coyle, for languages, languaging with us today. It was really very interesting. Are there any questions from the audience to Do Coyle? I mean, one of the things I could do would be to ask you to language what you think I've just said. <laughs> Try it. Just, just have a minute. With, your, with somebody sitting by you, just put into your own words some of the key messages. Remember, I said, message to self. What have, you, what have you written down there? Just try it. Go on, go for it. And I don't care which language you use. You can use Swahili if you like. I don't care, you know? It works. Okay. So was that all right? Was that okay? Yeah. We're okay for hmm? We're okay for time. Okay, thank you. That is such a nice sound to hear. Lots of people talking, I can tell you. It's really good. Okay, questions then? Um, well, I just have a remark. You were talking about the academic language, yeah. which uh, some people already learn in the family. Uh, so uh, one of my questions is how can we do what kind of measures can we take to, to overcome this gap mm -hmm. of those who learn it early and mm -hmm. easily and those who will learn it maybe quite late mm -hmm. and they're older, 15, 16 or later? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we're talking about language register and the fact that um, in our home context there are different kinds of languages that are used in the family and the, the register, the genre, all that kind of thing um, in some uh, areas may be different from others. And it's part of our responsibility 
in the materials that we used to um, enable that access to academic language. And I think it has to be done systematically. And also, if we're working in a differentiated classroom, there'll always be some students who have that ease and, and are the talkers, and they'll always be the more silent or the more limited in, in terms of, of language uh, students that we have. And there's always a tendency to rely heavily on the talkers, the ones that will always be the ones ready to da 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 da. Um, and so again, I think it comes down to class design and we have to look at how we are designing those tasks to give those children, sorry, young people, an opportunity to um, actually talk about their learning and to teach them and how to teach them key um, academic phrases. I remember when I was doing my PhD, the first thing I did, and this is thinking like a bit like a linguist, was to get two or three um, academic papers, I went through them and I made a vocabulary list, can you imagine? And I came across words like purport. Now, I don't know whether you know what purport means, you'll only ever find that in an academic text. So and so purports, it means to put forward an idea, okay? And I had a whole list of these things because that was my entry into academic language because um, at that level, I didn't use it, and it was written language, it was, not, um, it was not spoken language. So I think there's no easy answer to this, but I think it's around you, the, the way that the tasks are organised that enable those students to actually use the ways of arguing, of um, explaining. And this is where, if you think, do um, organise, explain and argue, if you work to that sort of um, idea and evaluate your tasks according to that, you will automatically get somewhere arguing and some are discussing. Do you know, sometimes you might think that I've been pretty harsh on things like grammar, but I did say bathwater and babies. And, you know, sometimes I need something. I need a, a phrase or I need a good uh, a piece of language. If somebody makes me repeat it 20 times, I'll remember it. So let's not forget that just coming out of role almost and saying, look, this is what you need to learn. Go and learn it, and I'll test you on it tomorrow. So all of those little strategies that have come from cavemen almost, we've still got to use them. So I think part of it is that awareness, the fact that some students will articulate much better than others. But for those who don't, we have a duty to make sure that they have access to those key, um, key really key phrases that are linked, the key language rather, that is linked to the subject area in which they are working. So it sounds a very nebulous answer, but I think it's something that has to be planned in over time. And it's deliberately planned in you know, I don't know if you do lesson plans or how you operate in your different institutions, but actually having this, a focus on how to argue or a focus on how to explain, a focus on, that's really important. And then saying, well, you could say it like this, which is simple everyday language, or you could say it like this, which is more appropriate. And I think we have to do some really deliberate teaching because osmosis, let's face it, takes a long time. Okay, and we're not in a uh, environment, we're not in an English environment. Um, so that's, you know, it's not an easy answer because it's not, a, it's not an easy um, situation, but I think we have to deal with it and we have to deal with it systematically. Yeah. So some more questions. Uh, just, yeah, I think it's really, um, very important as well, as you say, uh, if we have a different level of students, as well maybe to use uh, digital instruments. I think of EDX mm -hmm. courses, where we really can, for example, this language of um, scientific language, where we could as well give to those young people that are maybe they have a little bit of difficulty in language but then they could be trained so the teacher could say look i have this tool for the ones that are not 
that that have for them that is it is more it is harder to to learn and to train and so this is a little bit my vision as well to have this way this kind of tools uh, for um, tech technology and environment mm -hmm. environment i'm invi i'm geographer and environment mm -hmm. Consultant, mm -hmm. and as well, what I think: Do you have uh, tips for linking the the, the classes, the teams, uh, or to build teams and link the teams to experts in real life, mm -hmm. okay. or in real world? R real world. I think two two things here. First of all, um, this notion of enabling students to. Um, access digitally all kinds of areas is crucial and so why did the flipped classroom become so important because it's a time saver so for homework if you're or for work out of class if you're giving your students um, YouTube videos to watch then they are more likely to do that than you spend lots and lots of time doing the explaining and then they come back to you with the questions that they want. So I, you know, I can't under, underscore enough the importance of that, that way of broadening the language and the experience through using digital means. We've got that resource now and we must really, really use it. Um, also, in terms of connectedness, um, one of the things that we've got um, or used to do when a, um, uh, sort of at, at university level is to have video walls and so for example the vets uh, the vet students linked up with vet surgeries because they wanted to see what was happening in real life how the vet, how the expert vet um, dealt with the uh, own pet owners often it was um, and so I think those and that's just an example but I mean the fact now that we can do such cheap um, video connections means that we should actually be looking at um, how can we link our classroom with experts, how can we link our classroom with other classrooms and it is possible to do without breaking the bank um, because I know I couldn't do my work um, in Edinburgh if I didn't have video walls with um, six schools and so my students can go any time and they can, they're invited into a lesson, they can see what's going on, they can ask questions to the students, they can ask questions to the teacher. Um, so I'm just saying that really, come on, um, those digital links are crucial. And I think you find them, I mean, um, British Council do things like uh, e-twinning, but that tends to be more school-oriented. I don't know of any networks that are more um, at, at the professional level. I don't know them. But if they don't exist, then they need to be formed. And it's two ways. It's linking with each other, so you can do that easily, so that you, your students are working on joint projects, fantastic for languaging with each other, um, and also linking with um, associations and experts and so on that exist, and getting them to, to, uh, to in input. So, uh, yeah, that's a great suggestion.